Proverbs chapter 22, verse 16. 22, 16. He that oppresses the poor. We're not starting good. He that oppresses the poor increases his riches. He gives the hard he gives the poor a hard time. He deceives the poor, injustice to the poor, and he gets more money. And he that giveth to the rich. I mean, if that's not a description of the government, what is? If that's not big business, what is? And the Bible looks down upon somebody, well, just because they're poor, we'll take advantage of them and we'll, we'll soak their pockets dry. The Bible calls it a sin. Now watch what it says. See if I find where it was. Shall surely come to want. And you say, well, I know plenty of rich people. They've died and they had everything. Yeah, they died. But what about the afterlife? If they end up in hell, they're going to just want a little drop of water. If they're saved, oh, Lord forbid to them, if they're saved, they're going to want a crown. Walk around. I mean, if we do cast our crowns with the elders, kind of hard to throw your crown at Jesus if you ain't got one. Bow down thy ear. Pay attention. Listen. And hear the words of the wise. And apply thy heart unto my knowledge. Biblical wisdom, biblical understanding, biblical knowledge. With the whole book of Proverbs, the whole book of the Bible. For it's a pleasant thing if thou keep them within thee. What we just read in verse 17. They shall withal be fitted in thy lips. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be shamed, but rightly divine the word of truth. And Peter, we'll look at it in a moment, tells us we're supposed to give ready an answer to anybody. We'll look at that in a moment. Christians don't study. Christians don't apply their ear to wisdom. They don't put their heart to knowledge. Not with the modern church movement today. You'll be in trouble. That thy trust may be in the Lord. Oh, my page, we've got our greatest preacher, greatest scholar. I got my favorite author. But what about the Bible? You know how many Christians. Don't read their Bible. Never mind study it. You know how many Christians don't know how to witness to a lost man and tell them how to get saved? And do you know how much no, no wit, wisdom and knowledge is coming out of the pulpit? I have known I have made known to thee this day, even to thee. That's Solomon writing. The book of Proverbs. Proverbs. Solomon saying about Proverbs so far where we're at. And we got more. This is the wisdom, understanding, and knowledge of God. You better listen. And it's well advised that one of, the, one of your daily Bible readings is according to the date. And today is the 19th. You should have read Proverbs 19 tomorrow, Proverbs 20. But who reads their Bible? Have I not written to thee excellent things? Solomon and Councils of Knowledge, Book of Proverbs. When we get to Ecclesiastes, when we get to Song of Solomon. 
And then we're looking at God through the Holy Spirit, all 66 books. I only read the New Testament. You've got not even a quarter of the Bible. There are 39, no, there are 39 books of the Old Testament and then subtract 66. Lost number. It's okay. That I might make the known the certainty of the words of truth, that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee. First Peter 3.15 You know why some people say, well, I, I'm afraid to answer because you don't study the answer. First Peter 3.15, and God's going to hold you accountable. But sanctify, set apart the Lord God in your hearts. Oh, that's interesting. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you for a reason of hope. That is in you meekness and fear. Somebody's going to ask you a question when you're supposed to answer. And then the study of the word of God, you come across an answer that you don't have. You're not to make anything up. You're to say, okay, I don't know. And then you're going to go home and study that answer for the next time you're asked that question. Or a question there about. And to say, well, I don't read my Bible. That's not an excuse. I had a man one time, he said, oh, I don't read my Bible. I don't read the Old Testament. Well, that's what man said. That's what a man told me. You're going to stand before the man Christ Jesus. You're going to stand before the word of God himself. First John 1 and first, I mean, John chapter 1 and first John chapter 5. I mean, I can just see for the Christian, never mind the lost man, I can just see for the Christian, well, why did I give you the Bible? Why did I teach you how to read? Why is the King James Bible in elementary English to learn? Oh, you know more about a sports team. You know more about politics. You know more about a car. You know more about the worldly things, but you know zilch about my word. I, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what it is today too. Bring them to church and let the pastor do it. That's laziness. Now I had one time in my life I brought somebody to the pastor. She was my girlfriend. I wanted her to be my, my fiance, to be my wife. And I didn't want her decision of Christ to be because she loves me. I brought her to the pastor of the church to make sure that her salvation wasn't me, but was truly of God. And I said the other day, I said, listen, I don't, I don't, you know, come to my church, come to my church. I don't do that. Now, there have been people I invited to church. And my, my dad and my father-in-law, I invited to church only after I witnessed to them countless times. And I thought the opportunity to guess preacher that was coming or what the series of sermons were. I thought, okay, maybe if they heard them, it would water a seed of what I already planted. Many people will come to church and, you know, they let, let the pastor put the planting in. That's laziness. And that's forbidden by what you're to give an account. I got to, uh, let's see here, Job 26.1. Let's see what that one is. Job 26.1. You're supposed to give account. You're supposed to go witness. You're to go in all the world and preach the gospel. And I said, Job 26.1. Job 26.1 are six questions. 
And these six questions, I believe, with others, they might be asked to us Christians at the judgment seat of Christ. But Job answered and said, How hast thou help that is without power? Here's somebody that they have no power. How'd you help them? What knowledge, wisdom, and understanding of God did you bring them? How savest thou the arm that has no strength? Somebody's weak. What'd you do to help him? How hast thou counseled him that has no wisdom? How'd you witness the people? I let my light shine. Okay, that's that's a cute little Bible verse you can put it put on uh, above the door. But how does your light counsel somebody? And when I deal with those people, well, do you witness? You tell, you know, I just let my light shine. Well, do you tell them, I let my light shine. How hast thou plentifully declared the thing that it is? How have you told somebody who's against God, against Jesus, against the Bible, against creation? How have you declared to them, hey, well, you know, we ought to go vote. There's nowhere in the Bible says vote. They didn't vote for David. They didn't vote for Solomon. They didn't vote for any of the kings. No one ever voted for Jesus to be king of king and lord of The Bible says get out there and preach the gospel. You're more to preach. How'd you debate? How'd you? Well, you know, I, I go to Mary. The Bible says there's one meeting between God and man. The man, that's not Mary. She's a female. Christ Jesus. I'm good. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. How have you declared? And to whom hast thou uttered words? Ooh, who'd you speak? Jesus said, Every idle word shall man give an account thereof. And then whose spirit came from me? Godly spirit? Or a devilish spirit? Or a man's spirit? There's a Holy Spirit? There's a devilish spirit, and there's man's spirit. Which one did you speak of? Rob not the poor. Boy, Solomon, leave the, leave the rich people alone. There are people who rob the poor. They take advantage of the poor. And governments and taxes... And fair market value. I think when we get done with the great white throne judgment, long after we're done with the judgment seat of Christ, I think after the great white throne judgment, I think we're going to realize that God's going to show to us all that man was capable to help his fellow man and didn't. We have got the technology today. I guarantee we can make a car run without needing an auto mechanic, but then, you know, you got to pay that auto mechanic and you got to buy our parts and you, and then all these recalls, you sure not putting work and sure not putting ethnics into your car when you got to hand us a warranty. You put it, oh, we know about that problem, but it's more cheaper, you know, if we do this, the lawyers and the beanbag counters, it, it's cheaper if we just do it like this. You're robbing the poor. God says, well, I don't believe in God. Prepare to meet thy God. Rob not the poor because he is poor. Your motive. Well, he can't do nothing about it. He can't afford lawyers. He can't afford to defend himself. So he's in our power. Neither oppress the afflicted in the gate. Now the gate is the courthouse. It's the city hall. Where you did your legal business. So in the realm of municipalities, in the realm of, of, of civil powers, of rulership and politics, and the offices of city and town management, and state, 
and county and country. Whether it's a president or king or queen or prime minister. God is sent forth by a king to say, we're not going to, you're not supposed to rob the poor because they're poor and they, they can't defend themselves. And you're not to oppress them. You're not to afflict them. When they come to the gate, they're coming to the gate for hell, but there's been injustice to me. And you go out there and get your 400 lawyers to their one lawyer. And their one lawyer plays golf with the 400 lawyers. That's going to be all weighed out one day. Saved or lost. For the Lord will plead their cause, the poor and afflicted, and spoil the soul of those that spoil them. Imagine God sitting on his throne, Jesus Christ. Judgment seat of Christ if you're saved, the great white throne judgment if you're lost. And God making the record straight by that. Imagine God preparing to all the people. Imagine judgment seat of Christ, God calling up a pastor of a church and declaring to all the people in the congregation that guy was only in it because he wanted the money and he didn't care about them, but he cared about them. And he did not know as much as he, you thought he knew. And he was just throwing you a line and hook and sinker. And then when you realize one day all your favorite political can uh, polit uh, political people, God will put them on a judgment judge at the judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne judgment, and he will reveal all their sins. And to who they sin to. And all your misconceptions. That's why we have a great and wonderful King of Kings, Lord of Lords, God, Judge of all the world. Because he'll take it all. And, be, and by the time that the last man is cast into the lake of fire that burneth forever, everything will be made right. All evil be, be declared evil, even if you called it good. All just judgment and recompense will come to be made right. And if you did have injustice, it will be made justice by God. And if there were briberies or if there were kinship or if there was clickfulness, whatever it is, God's going to weigh it out, the judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne judgment. Don't worry about this world right now. They may die in luxury. They may die in, 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 in falsehood. God will undo that falsehood. Make no friendship with an angry man. And with a furious man thou shalt not go. Least thou learn his way. And get a snare to thy soul. You know what's wrong with anger management? You know, you go to, you go learn classes and every you know you, you've been angry. You go to you got a whole bunch of people in a room, and they're in angry management because they've been anger, <laughs> they've been furious. You know what the Bible says? When you got an angry man, and you make friends with him. You're capable of learning to be angry like him. And woe be if you got angry people in one room being angry. They're going to learn to be angrier. And we are in a world today that you can't pass them and you cannot not pass them. you got to pass them all because everybody gets a break. And how dare you limit my... You know, my sex, how dare you, my race, or, or my age. You, you have to give everybody a trophy. And if a man makes friendship with an angry man, and the Bible says, warning to a furious man, <coughs> do not go that way because you can learn. What are you going to do when you got a room filled with them? You're in trouble.
and get a snare, a trap to thy soul. Be not thou one of them that strike hands, shaking hands, making deals. Or of them that are sureties, loans for debts. Now in the law for the Jewish people, you were not to charge interest to another Jew. That was forbidden, but you could charge the Gentiles, but you couldn't charge the Jews. And what Solomon is making a step, don't go into business so you would make somebody go into debt more. That goes back with the poor. Because he's poor, you're going to add interest. You're going to put over his head a loan that he needs. But you're going to make it harder for him. Because the Bible says up here in verse 7, the bower is a servant to the lender. If thou hast nothing to pay, why should he take away thy bed from under thee? The general rule is, if there's a need, and it's a genuine need, you're to help them. You're not to put them in debt. When when they come back under Ezra and Nehemiah, they're like, they're trying to, I forget the walls of the temple, which one? And they come to Ezra and Nehemiah and say, we, we, we mortgage our homes, we mortgage our vineyard, we mortgage everything. And they undid the mortgaging. And you know who did the mortgaging? The Jewish people. They put such a burden upon the Jewish people, which is forbidden in the book of Proverbs. Now, I'll tell you what the greatest burden that is, is the field of renting housing where the landlord has a great advantage over the rent, over the leasee and the renter, and they have no power at all. God will get even. God will straighten it out. Mercy is what verse 27 is teaching. Remove not the ancient landmark. Now that's what Ahab wanted to do. When he went up to Naboth. Oh, I want that vineyard. I'll give you, I'll give you a better land. David says, I can't do it. I can't give my father. And he was completely right according to the law. It was a time of Elijah that a widow and her son, he told her, he says, go away. There's a great famine coming in the land. Go protect yourself. Leave the land. And when she came back, Elijah's servant was happening talking to the king. And as he's talking to the king, the woman and her son came in. Goes, hey, that's the one I was just talking about. And she's like, King, I've come back from the end of the uh, end of the serv uh, the servant. I'm end of the famine. <clears throat> and the king responded to her, giving her land back. That was her family's land. When Naomi comes back, she gets the land back of her son of her sons and her husband. But I guarantee, by the time you're up to Jeremiah, and by the time you're up to Ahab and Israel and, and Jeremiah and Judah, I guarantee the land had been swindled, the land had been stolen, eminent domain, for the government. It is remarkable to see today when you drive around, no trespassing, government property. How does a government own property when a government is not even a person? That government property that I can't go walking on is my property because you wouldn't have a government if it wasn't for me paying my taxes. How do you own property and forbidding me to go on my own property that I own that you have in my name? These things that the, the, these farmer's market and these block parties. How dare you close off a street that belongs to me and forbid me, the owner and the taxpayer and the resident of that city, 
you are forbidding me to go on my own property. And you say, because it's the property of the city. There is no city without the people. Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers, which would have been Joshua, have set. Book of Joshua. See thou a man diligent in business. He takes, he does everything he's supposed to do. Pays his taxes, pays his employees, settles accounts, gets the proper goods he needs. He shall stand before king. What honor? He shall not stand before mean men. And that's opposite of kings. It's cruel people. Obscure men. He's going to stand in the business of right men, not bad men, when he's got a good business. That sure ain't today. 